Geeks, a group of young yeshiva students felt that their synagogue in Crown Heights, Brooklyn was too small and too crowded. So they decided to expand the synagogue by building a completely useless tunnel that was 60 feet long and which ended up undermining the foundations of the synagogue and nearby residences. Apparently, they started working on this thing in 2020. It was the pandemic, they were bored, they decided to build a fort like every other kid, but they took it too far. News of this tunnel broke only because the elders at the synagogue learned of it and called in construction workers to fill it with cement. But these kids stood in the way, which caused a brawl and which the police had to get in the middle of. Now this story has unleashed a series of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories online because it's not crazy enough, so people have to add more absurdity to it. And I know that getting a permit for a building expansion in Brooklyn probably takes an act of Congress, but what in the world were these guys thinking? You think if we dig far enough, we could reach Yankee Stadium? Bruh, yeah, totally. We should add a TV in that corner so we can watch American Ninja Warrior. I can't wait to show my mom. Uh, so heavy. Ah. Cool. I swear you can't make this stuff up. We got a full show this week. We'll start with the strikes against Houthis in Yemen, the Iowa caucuses and Republican FOPO, the drama around Guatemala's new president, Iran is acting like a repressive regional hegemon, and Cape Verde is malaria free. Before we start though, please hit the subscribe button below, click the notification bell, and like this video. The US and UK have struck Houthi military targets in Yemen three times so far in an effort to degrade the Houthis' ability to attack vessels in the Red Sea. And the Biden administration also announced it would be redesignating the Houthis as a terrorist group. Since the beginning of the war in Gaza, Houthis have been attacking vessels in these waters because they claim it's an effort to pressure Israel to stop its operations in Gaza. So initially, the US grouped an international coalition of navies to protect these waters, but the Houthis continued with their attacks. And that's because the Houthis are not the most rational actors. Just look at this video of a Houthi Houthi leader. Look at him, he never even blinks. I don't trust anyone who doesn't blink. The Houthis have responded by attempting to attack a US destroyer, and they successfully hit a US owned container ship and a Greek ship as well. Some have praised the US and UK for their move, and others have criticized it. Progressives in Congress, for example, claimed the president violated the Constitution for not getting congressional approval for these strikes. So let me clear that up. While Article 1 of the Constitution requires that Congress authorize war, Article 2 designates the president as commander in chief, which allows him to use military force for defensive purposes without getting congressional approval. This attack is considered defensive because it's in response to Houthi attacks on ships in the Red Sea, which pose a direct threat to the national security and economy of the United States, and may I add the world. That brings me to the economic side of this issue, which explains why the US and UK had to do this. Geek out with me. Around 15% of global seaborne trade goes through the Red Sea, including really important items like grain, oil, and natural gas. Because of the Houthi attacks in these waters, traffic in the Suez Canal has fallen by 61%. And at least 18 shipping companies have now stopped shipping through the Red Sea, and many are rerouting around Africa, which not only causes delays, but contributes to an increase in shipping costs, which is a cost passed on to, you guessed it, you the consumer. The price of container shipping from Asia to Europe has already increased by nearly 200%. So what the US and UK are doing is first, sending a message to the Houthis and terrorists everywhere that they are not allowed to hijack international waters. And second, they are protecting these waterways in order to prevent global inflation for everybody. The only word that should be coming out of people's mouths is thank you. Now, of course, any escalation is concerning. And so I asked you all if you thought this would turn into a full-scale war. And 54% of you said it would probably just remain in more tit-for-tat attacks. I agree with that. And that's because while I expect the Houthis to continue their assaults for as long as they can, ultimately they and their Iranian backers are no match for the US and the UK. And they know that. Iowa kicked off the election year with the first Republican caucuses, where Donald Trump received 51% of the vote, Ron DeSantis came in second with 21%, and Nikki Haley with 19%. The most positive news of the night was that Vivek Ramaswamy finally decided to end his campaign. But don't worry, he will continue to screw our ears on his podcast. Over at Oh My World, we thought it'd be fun to give you all cheat sheets on where the three remaining Republican contenders are on the most important FOPO issues. Let's start with high heel wearing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis says that threats from China should be our number one one priority. On Ukraine, he doesn't love Ukraine aid and says that lengthy wars only weaken the US and benefit China by absorbing American attention and resources. And he has expressed support for Israel, but also said the current war is Israel's and that America shouldn't get too involved. 
Next is former South Carolina governor, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and former underdog Nikki Haley. When she was U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Haley was a strong supporter of Israel, and in 2018, she defended Israel's use of force against Palestinian demonstrators in Gaza. She views China as our number one adversary, and said that the conflicts in Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan are all connected by a, quote, unholy alliance, including Iran, Russia, and China. And she's strongly in favor of sending aid to Ukraine, since she believes weak support could encourage China to invade Taiwan. Last but not least, former president and current criminal Donald Trump. Trump claims that even before he's inaugurated, he will have settled the Ukraine war and will have ended the, quote, endless flow of American treasure there by asking European allies to reimburse the U.S. for the cost of rebuilding stockpiles. Uh-huh. It's all very reminiscent of Mexico paying for the wall. On China, Trump wants to decrease how much we buy from China and ban Chinese ownership of critical infrastructure in the U.S. China. And on Israel, Trump criticized Israel and complimented Hezbollah, but he said he stands with Israel to destroy Hamas, and while he was president, he was very supportive of Israel. Geeks, I'm warning you now, this election season is gonna suck. On January 13th, Bernardo Arevalo, who is known as the Corruption Crusader, was inaugurated as Guatemala's new president. And even though he won the election by more than 20 percentage points, he almost didn't get sworn in. A lot of drama there. Let's unpack it. For years, Guatemala has been ruled by corrupt political elites who have personally profited from their government roles. And as a result, the country is not only rife with corruption and poor governance, but also poverty and drug violence, which has driven millions from there to the United States. So in comes Bernardo Arevalo, who was the son of Guatemala's first democratically elected president and who promises to fight corruption and revive democracy. He won the elections back in August in a landslide. And from there, the political elites did everything they could to get in his way. His opponent, who was a former first lady, refused to accept his victory. Political elites and corrupt prosecutors launched all sorts of legal challenges against him and his party to prevent him from taking office. He even faced an assassination plot, and there was a rumor that authorities were going to arrest his running mate. Even hours before the inauguration, Guatemala's Supreme Court suspended his party's legal status in order to make it difficult for him to have any influence in the country's Congress. And then their Congress delayed the inauguration further by demanding unnecessary credentials from legislators who wanted to attend. Thankfully, international pressure from the US, the EU, and many Latin American leaders, and from protesting supporters, eventually made these assholes sit down, and Arevalo was sworn in nine hours behind schedule. Although this win did not come easy, Arevalo's inauguration was a triumph for democracy in Guatemala, and I'm hopeful he'll make positive change there. We need to be watching the Iranian regime super carefully, because every which way you look, they are behaving like terrorist dictators and now like a regional hegemon. Let's start with their foreign policy. Iran this week launched strikes in Pakistan that they said were for counterterrorism purposes, and also strikes in Iraq that they said were against the Mossad. Their proxies in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen are causing instability everywhere as they strike Israel, U.S. military bases, and commercial ships in the Red Sea. But that didn't stop the World Economic Forum from inviting Iran's foreign minister to their annual conference in the Alps, where he sat down with Fareed Zakaria for an interview, where he blatantly lied in response to every single question. I swear I got dumber by watching that interview. He repeated several times how Iran doesn't want things in the region to escalate further, and that Netanyahu needs to understand that war is not the solution. But he also said it's completely okay for Hamas to have committed its horrific October 7 attack, and for the Houthis to attack vessels in the Red Sea. We never believe war is the solution. Aru, how many missiles you need? No problem. Death to America. He also completely denied giving drones to Russia to use against Ukraine, which even Fareed Zakaria couldn't contain his face. And when he pushed back, the foreign minister said that people were copying their drones. Honey, it's not like copying a Louis Vuitton bag. Domestically, things are also absurd and abusive. Iran has just extended the prison sentence of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Narjis Mohammed for an additional 15 months on top of her 11-year sentence. And they did so because of her continued activism behind bars, where she fought against the compulsory hijab and shined a light on systematic sexual assaults against women in prison. Separately, Iranian authorities released two female journalists who had been imprisoned for reporting on Masa Amini, but then immediately threatened to send them back to jail after they posted a photo of themselves without a hijab. The reason I need you to pay attention to this is because Iran is showing extreme brazenness right now. 
They are behaving like terrorists across the region, and Middle Eastern leaders are not really pushing back. In fact, the only states pushing back are the US, UK, and those involved in the International Navy Coalition in the Red Sea. And so they feel emboldened, which is why it's also not surprising that their regional destabilizing behavior is coupled with a domestic crackdown. That kind of overconfidence is risky, because it portends more destabilizing and repressive behavior to come. For that reason, the Iranian regime and their lying foreign minister are on my shit list this week. On a much happier note, on the other side of the world, Cape Verde is officially malaria-free. Last week, the World Health Organization declared this small group of islands off the western coast of Africa a malaria-free country. And this is huge for a few reasons. 90% of malaria cases worldwide occur in Africa, and Cape Verde is only the third country there to be malaria-free, following Mauritius and Algeria. You get malaria from a mosquito bite, and it kills over half a million people each year. The vast majority are children under the age of five. And the worst part of that is that most of these deaths are preventable. Since the 1980s, the Cape Verde government has been working hard to institute new systems and structures to prevent the disease. And this not only helps protect their people, but it attracts tourists who will feel safer traveling there, which in turn helps their developing economy. It's win-win-win. And this is especially important because it sets a positive example for other countries in the region with high malaria rates by showing that malaria is manageable and defeatable through consistent effort and innovation. If you want to help in the fight to eradicate malaria, check out Malaria No More and United to Beat Malaria. Thanks, geeks. Before we go, we want to give an Oh My World shout out to Madison Marsh, who is the first active duty Air Force officer to become Miss America. She graduated from the Air Force Academy in Colorado, and she's a second lieutenant in the Air Force. Yeah, makes you feel real unaccomplished, but we're proud of her nonetheless. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe, drop us a comment below, and check us out across social media and on podcast. Stay fabulous, geeks.